It's nice to see uh, a lot of the faces back for another Photo PXL chats, and uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun today. Just wanted to uh, go over our, our schedule as it's falling together right now. Today is April 24th with Dan uh, Steinhardt, otherwise known to many of us as Dano. Um, on May 8th, we'll have Holger, who is part of our team, do a presentation. Um, he and Jeff will run the show. I'll be gone. Uh, May 22nd, Rad Drew uh, will be coming on. Rad does a lot of stuff with mobile photography, infrared, and a lot of other things. Um, uh, Jeff and I both know him. He's a real good guy, so he'll be running that. Yeah, and you know, you say that, but you've never introduced me to him. I've never met him in real life. Well, next time you're down, I'll make sure that, that we make that in real life. But you, you're, right. acquainted, you're acquainted with each other. Yeah, we know each other's work. <clears throat> On June 5th, we have uh, Hugh Brownstone. We're going to start that program uh, at 1.30 in the afternoon, but I'll put the notifications out for that when we do that. Uh, Hugh's well known for uh, a YouTube channel called Three Men and an Elephant. And he's also a street photographer, teaches street photography, and uh, he'll be joining us. Uh, he's a very well-spoken kind of guy, lots of fun to listen to. Um, and then on the 19th of June, Alan Ross will uh, be uh, visiting us and Holger will be hosting that uh, presentation. Uh, then we'll have one more in between, which I'm working on a guest for. And then on July 17th, we have Suzanne Mathias joining us, who uh, is always a fun person to, to have on board and it's uh, lots of cool yeah. stuff to, to talk about. So That's things right. are coming together and we're, we're getting planned out longer and longer and further and further out. So it's oh. pretty darn cool. Hey, is, is Alan Ross, is that Michael Alan Ross who shoots the cars? No, this is, is Alan a car Ross photographer. Who shoots, um, okay. Landscapes. Very. He cool. was uh, Ansel Adams assistant for a while. <clears throat> okay. Different, different Alan Ross. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, your host, as many of you know, are the infamous Jeff Shiwi, myself, Kevin Raber, John Cornicello, who's the founder of this whole concept and program. I still, every time I start working on one of these things, try to figure out how he managed to do it two times a week during the uh, pandemic. And we have Holger, who joins us from Germany, he handles a lot of the graphics and other things, um, great part of the team. So the four of us work together to bring these programs to you. John, is it Cornicello or Cornicello? Should be cello, but I'll accept either one. Okay. <laughs> um, just to uh, tote a little bit of my uh, things going on, I've got the Faroe Islands workshop, which I'm heading to next week. Uh, we have the Palouse workshops. Uh, one of them sold out. I've got one spot left on uh, June 24th to the 29th, which will be a really nice time. Uh, there's only five of us on each of those trips, so it's very personal. Uh, we have a big SUV uh, Suburban, and we go a lot of places. It's nonstop photography in the uh, Tuscany of America. Anybody who wants to go, sign up. It's a trip that, you know, you'll take lots of good pictures and be very busy afterwards. I've done it a few times with Jeff. Um, then on the 13th and the 22nd, I only have uh, one cabin left for my trip to Greenland. We're going to a new fjord system in Greenland this year. Um, the great country of Greenland has decided that Scoresbury Sound, where everybody goes, uh, they decided they didn't want so many tourisms in there and boats, and they make it very difficult because they say there's whales breeding there, which uh, I've yet to see in all my trips to that, that area. But we have found a, a new peninsula and fjord system with a lot more possible landing areas that are really old, really interesting, an old Air Force base and stuff. So uh, that's going to be one heck of a trip, and that's the 13th to the 22nd of August. Uh, I've got a fine art printing workshop on uh, May 31st to June 3rd. I've been doing those with uh, Jeff and John Panazzo. Those things have been going really, really well. We make a lot of prints, learn a lot of things, and have a good time together. Uh, still a couple openings on uh, that particular workshop if somebody wants to join us. Uh, Jeff won't be there on that trip. That's kind of a forewarning. And then we have another one in October, which Jeff will be at. Um, and that's our final one for the year. And somewhere over the summer, we'll be posting our workshops for next year. Uh, these are all held at the Indianapolis Arts Center, where I'm an artist in residence, have a gigantic studio. And I also teach other classes there also. So uh, we're about to begin this meeting. Um, we will mute everybody. And then 
the speakers will have to unmute themselves. Um, and if you have any questions, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, we'll take questions in the chat, which John will uh, be watching. And uh, every now and then, if we see a couple good ones come up, we'll interrupt Dano and uh, throw a couple questions out there. Or otherwise, we'll hold them all to the end where we can have uh, a general talk and, and discussion. Also, just so you know, if you're in the Indianapolis area or close by, uh, this is something I'm running every quarter down at the Art Center, and this is Indie Captures, and we've got two great women speakers that are, uh, they're both photojournalists that'll be speaking, giving a demo. Uh, we've got an open, well, we don't have an open bar, but we have a bar that you can pay for. <laughs> and uh, it's quite an evening to bring the uh, photographic community of Indianapolis together. Uh, that's a lot, a lot of fun if you're around. And I don't have anything up here at this particular point, but uh, I've also arranged on June 8th, Art Wolf will be coming in in Indiana, Indianapolis, and uh, we have a beautiful auditorium with a sound system and the whole 10 yards, and uh, Art's going to spend two days uh, doing not only his programs on creativity, but a program about his new book and other things like that. And uh, that'll be open up to anybody that wants to come down to that one. And we'll put some postings up on that and on my website in the very near future. So i uh, got a lot of things planned and it's going to be a lot of fun. And hopefully that program is just the lead in to doing one every couple months with a number of well-known photographers talking about actually more the creative process than the actual photography, but uh, they'll be inspirational and uh, uh, they're called Indie Talks. So we'll talk more about those as the time comes on. So today's guest is uh, somebody we all know, a lot of us do, uh, Dano, Dan, Dano uh, Steinhardt, Dan Steinhardt from Epson. Uh, I've known Dano for years. We've done a bunch of videos together, worked together on some projects. Uh, he is probably the largest advocate for the photographer when it comes to printing. Uh, that's how a lot of us know him. His dedication to fine art printing and doing a lot of other things is uh, second to none. So it's, it's quite nice. Um, and I'm very pleased that Dano is part of our, our show today. But before we begin with Dano, uh, Jeff, did you have something you wanted to start off with or anything? Jeff's at a loss for words. Yeah, he's at a loss for words, or he's told, his, his lips are moving. Jeff, talk to us. <laughs> he's he's doing all the Jeff things, but he's not talking. Not sharing his screen either. No, there. Yeah. Well, well, he's sharing his screen, but hopefully we'll have some discussion from him. And Dano, I'm sorry, but this is part of the game. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Jeff, we do not hear you. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, we got you now. Okay, <laughs> my name is Jeff Shiwi, and I've apparently known Dano, Dan Dano Steinhardt, since the mid-1980s. Uh, the first time I met him, he paid me money to come to Rochester to tell the the film engineers, why photographers liked Fuji Velvia. They just couldn't understand why uh, photographers didn't like the real colors that Kodak had in Kodak, uh, Kodachrome. Um, but then what apparently I found out later is that this image was the image that I did that made Dan, drove Dan Steinhardt out of the photography business. Uh, he was a struggling photographer in Chicago, so was I. And uh, so he ended up seeing one of the, my ads in Chicago Talent Sourcebook, saw this and he said, well, screw it. I'm never gonna be better than him and I'm gonna get, find something else to do. Uh, so Dano, and this, I, I've done portraits. I've got some nice shots of Dano. I've got some not so nice shots of Dano as well, which I'll show in a moment. But um, the thing that I wanted to get across is that um, he is a photographer with little hair. And a lot of us are losing our hair 
I still have long hair, what's left of it. Uh, but um, anyway, Dano is the photographer, and he's apparently going to be doing a whole series where he's now Dano. I'll I'll lend you these shots if you want. Uh, in in fact, look down and stick your head close to the camera. Yeah. Okay. So you can see he actually has a little bit less hair now than he used to have. Uh, up close and personal. So, um, but, you know, nice shot of Dano. But the thing that I know Dano the most about is that in the early 2000s, uh, Jack Resnicki, um, Andrew Rodney, Mac Holbert, John Paul Caponegro, Greg Gorman, who couldn't be here today, but is <laughs> living vicariously. And he'll look at the Zoom later. So, hi, Greg. Um, we did a thing called the Epson Print Academy where we went around and did a day long workshop teaching photographers basically how to print. The thing that was the most impressive was we actually, the, 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 the real benefit was seeing what a really good print looked like because Dano would get really good prints from really good photographers and light them in the, Print Academy gallery. And so people could look at how good the photographs looked. So this was uh, an Epson Print Academy that we did in Seattle. Dan, are you remember this? Yeah. Uh, um, this was Bruce Frazier, our long uh, but not forgotten Bruce Frazier. Um, we had a special guest, Mac uh, uh, brought. Um, Graham Nash, and uh, basically it was Graham Nash and Mac Holbert. It was a rock star with a hacksaw that that basically uh, invented digital fine art printing. Um, and it, it basically it was Mac talk and Graham talking about how Graham, uh, he had a, 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 a whole bunch of negatives that were sent off to Japan and uh, lost. And so all Graham had was uh, um, uh, contact sheets. And, and so um, Mac was working with uh, guys uh, whose name escaped me, uh, trying to come up with a way of recreating photographic prints. And so they took their iris printer and used a hacksaw to get rid of the paper guide uh, so that they could do uh, uh, iris prints. Um, so here's me talking. Uh, we had a picture of JP with his tongue. Um, I have some tongue shots later that I'm going to show. Uh, but the thing that it allowed people to actually see really good prints. And Bruce was often not amused. Um, we did one in, and Dan, Dano, this was the varsity uh, uh, diner in, in Atlanta, Georgia, I think. Um, yeah. A lot of times we went out and had really good meals. Sometimes we had shitty meals, although generally it was Greg in charge of picking the restaurant based upon the wine list. Um, I'm not sure why you needed a straw sticking in your nose, but um, I'll, I'll give you this one too, Dano, if you want it. Uh, but it was magical. I mean, Mac could do magical things with spoons. Uh, Henry Wilhelm and Mac, uh, that's the way I would uncork a bottle of wine. Uh, I think I got caught by a, a uh, lobster. I'm not sure where this was. Uh, and then occasionally I would actually attack Dano. Uh, and then Greg is just really dubious uh, that 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 uh, Dano had this the photographer shirt uh, or or uh, um, jacket. Uh, and the thing that I love about this shot is the nose, Dano's nose in profile. Um, but Dano was known to tip a glass with some vino in it. Uh, we had this great big dinner that Greg organized in uh, uh, Seattle with winemakers. And and uh, I don't remember all the wines that we had, but we had quite a bit of wine. A and I did tongue shots. So this is Graham Nash's wine-stained tongue. 
This is Henry Wilhelm. Henry, you remember this? Greg Gorman, me, and Dan Steinhardt. And then this is us in the van on the way back <laughs> to the hotel after the wine tasting, uh, after the dinner. Uh, uh, so <laughs> um, uh, poor Becky in the back. I Oh, so that's pretty much all I wanted to show. So how the hell do I get out of... <clears throat> I'm not seeing my... Uh... I can stop you. Okay, stop me. Oh, thank God. So what I'd like to do is to basically introduce Dan Steinhardt, who actually, underneath that, that <clears throat> calm, cool, hip collected appearance with uh, the prints in the background, is actually a very good photographer. And what he does is uh, he's, he's a student of Jay Maisel. He actually carries the damn camera around because uh, as Jay says, it's a lot easier to be a photographer if you actually have a camera. Uh, so, Dano, I'm, I'm, I want to hand it over to you so that you can actually show uh, photographs in self-defense to prove that you actually are a good photographer. Can you do that, Dano? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for bringing back uh, some good memories and some that I wish I didn't want to remember. <laughs> That's okay. And uh, Kevin, thanks for uh, inviting me to this. It's a little odd for me because I'm I'm usually behind the scenes and the marketing side of things, but I'll uh, show some of the stuff that I've been doing. I'm going to share my screen. And we were commenting about how I've really been working on getting great DMAX lately. And, <laughs> and there. So... Um, Kind of a follow on to. Can you move your cursor out of the middle of the screen? How's that? Um, okay. You know, I, I really like to emphasize uh, my baldness because it takes people uh, away from the distracting schnoz. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for bringing that one up. Uh, but I, uh, this is uh, Kevin said I needed a headshot, and I thought, well, maybe I should show my headshot series, which was inspired by. Ken Geiger, uh, the Photo Society National Geographic photographer, who saw me do a selfie over in the right there at Monument Valley, and he he sent me an email with this cropping saying, you're missing the boat, this is the crop. So whenever I'm in a vanishing point perspective, I try to do these kind of images. And uh, those are my uh, my Instagram. Uh, you're going to, I've been very, very lucky in my career to uh, have worked with amazing photographers, but there's two in particular that I'll be referencing a lot. Uh, one on the left is my amazing high school photo instructor. His name is Warren King. You know, contrary to what uh, people are kind of amazed by this, I'm a native Valley boy from Los Angeles. And uh, this is in uh, Reseda, California. And uh, we were kind of the best photo department at that time uh, in the country. And this is me accepting award in my leisure suit with hair, age 17, as the best high school photographer in North America. It's kind of been downhill ever since, but Warren uh, instilled in me a sense of design that we'll talk about. And on the right, a person that's had a, a great influence on me is Jay Maisel. This is actually a, a little shot from one of the shoots we did for the Epsom Print Academy. We're doing aerial work, with, and that's Jay uh, on the left, uh, or my right, and Hale Gerland, who was the helicopter pilot. Uh, and that uh, and Hale crashed a helicopter shortly after this, but that's a different story. But you'll hear me reference these two people. And, you know, my role is really the marketing manager at Epson. And, and we're not going to talk too much about Epson. But because of all the amazing photographers that I get to work with, uh, the people that I work very closely with with the early Print Academy days, as Jeff referenced, uh, it inspired me to get back into photography. And I just started <laughs> photographing images that I would see literally between meetings. And uh, I won't go into what specific meeting I was at all the time, but uh, I was in Miami and I think it was uh, some trade show and it was a, uh, for educators and everyone was going to South Beach, but I like to go where people don't go to. So I headed to Low Havana in Miami and I kind of befriended uh, some of these Cuban, I think they're originally from Cuba, 
They were, you know, involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion. This is uh, 20 years ago when I shot this. And they uh, took a liking to me. We were smoking cigars and drinking a lot of Cuban coffee. And I had to go to the baño, which is, you know, bathroom in Spanish. And I came across this mop, which reminded me of Cousin It from the Adams family. It's a great color. And I took a, a shot of this. And uh, and then I was back in Miami, like, uh, a few years later with a much better camera. You know, this is a six megapixel camera. I thought, oh, I can do this so much better. And I got to that same wall and it was painted brown and reminded me of what Jay Maisel always said around when you see the image, take it because it may not be there when you get back. Uh, we were doing a photo shoot for a campaign uh, where it was about uh, everything the photographers do in order to you know, get that final print. And it was going to be an aerial uh, shot with a chase plane following a, a World War II aircraft. This was with Miss Peterson. And we were in Arizona and it was in August. Mm -hmm. And these two uh, planes took off, and then within one minute, both planes came back. It was actually too hot to fly. They couldn't get the lift they needed. So essentially, we yeah. had a, um, a free afternoon. Yeah. I thought, well, it's Phoenix, it's August, it's going to be 120 degrees. Uh, I, I heard about this abandoned dog racing track in the mountains north of Phoenix. So I headed up there, and sure enough, it was cooler. It was about 118 degrees, but I found this amazing place that was pretty dangerous as far as stuff falling down. I found this chair and made this image again with an older camera. You know, this is maybe like a 12 megapixel camera. I was back in Phoenix about 18 months ago. Sure enough, you know, I looked on Google maps. There it was the dog racing truck, found a way to get up there and uh, much better camera equipment. I was prepared. I even had water this time. And uh, sure enough, it was now a, a housing development and it was gone. You know, Jay Maisel, he often talks about light, color, and gesture. And, you know, light, many people understand that. Color, many people understand. But gesture is that very uh, sometimes challenging, uh, difficult to get image. And this is a uh, lunch break. This is about two miles from our office in Southern California. Uh, and I just love the confidence and the, the gesture in this little girl. She looks over this kind of industrial landscape. I was doing a video with one of my heroes named Brian Lanker, and Brian uh, lived in Eugene, Oregon. It was my first trip to Oregon, and, and I was heading back to the airport in Portland to go home. And you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world; interstates and interstates. So I thought I should see a little bit more of Oregon. And I just kind of started taking side streets. This is a little pre-GPS, so I'm just getting lost. And I stumbled upon the Urban Iditarod, and uh, this started in Portland. It takes place in a few other uh, cities. And it's of the day of the Iditarod in uh, Alaska. Uh, in Portland, uh, people create teams, in this case, the chicken team, and they mush bar to bar. So it's this chaotic uh, group of hundreds of people, lots of drinking, lots of noise. But, you know, thinking back to Warren King about, uh, he would always talk about kiss, keep it simple, stupid. And I found that if I just got on my back and I got shot up and I was fortunate to have the sky, it almost looks like a studio shot. Yeah, I, I asked these guys to line up like chickens and then I told them to start pecking each other. And that's how I got the shot. It tends to be my signature image, although it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, I have gone to Japan uh, for several meetings at our offices. And when possible, I like to take an extra day and see things rather than some of my colleagues who uh, just fly in, spend the night, do a presentation, fly out and the jet lag and everything. It's like such an amazing country. So in this case, I actually went to uh, Osaka and this is the restaurant at the top of my hotel. I just thought, wow, it's an amazing view, but it's kind of a tourist thing, but I always remember about shapes and patterns, but it's much more interesting when the pattern is interrupted. So. A lot of my images, I've just learned if the scene has potential to wait. And in this case, when this one woman walked away from her little viewing station there on the left, that's what made this image for me. I was driving to the airport. You're, you're going to hear airports are coming to you know, a lot of my work. And I just saw this, this colorful something on the corner of my eye and drove around. And it was a swimming pool in, in Philadelphia. And this uh, lifeguard who was just looking for goggles in the deep end, but it just, there was something about 
the shapes and the line of his body and how it lined up with the stair rail that I really liked. Uh, this is a video we were doing for the Epson Print Academy with Bruce Dale at the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta. And it was my first time at one of these. And again, it was loud. You know, you don't realize if you haven't been to these things, they're really loud and you have all this, these uh, blowers and flames and people and whistles blowing and stuff. Uh, and, and it's mesmerizing when you're there and you're seeing all these things. But then I realized, you know, how can I make this a more interesting image? And when that one person in silhouette waved his flag, his hand goodbye with his hat, that was the gesture that made this image. Uh, on my first trip to Japan, I was mesmerized. Uh, and I looked this up later and, it, and it's um, kind of documented. There are many... Japanese women whose legs are, have a slight bow to them. It's just considered almost a beauty thing. And I was just fascinated by this. And uh, I started following women around in the streets of Tokyo. And I thought, I got to be careful here. People can get the wrong idea. But when this woman was stopped at a crosswalk and I saw this cone going in the opposite direction of her legs, uh, to me, this is kind of said Japan. And you'll see a common thing. You know, I'm very fortunate to travel a lot. And, uh, and sometimes I get to go to some interesting places. And I'll come home and my wife will say, Oh, you know, can I see the pictures of the Eiffel Tower, pictures of, you know, famous places around the world. And I usually come back with these kind of images that, that uh, I like. Uh, also in Tokyo, I was walking through Shinjuku train station. It's the busiest train station in the world. And Tokyo during the day, it tends to be pretty muted. You see a lot of people wearing black and gray and it comes alive at night in color. But I saw this woman in these yellow tights walking through the busiest train station. And it was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I saw her shoes and she was wearing these yellow heels. And like, oh, that's even more amazing. And I'm kind of following her. But, I, you know, I want to be careful not be the creepy, you know, American in a foreign country. And then I saw her walk up um, one of the stairs to one of the train platforms. And she was waiting for the train. And then I saw that yellow safety strip. And I thought, oh, this is great. But it was all this distracting thing in the background. So I just waited for a train to come through. And I just got very, very lucky that it was the yellow line because the trains are color-coded there. And uh, let that blur and got this image. This is uh, across the street from my hotel in Manhattan. It's Bryant Park, dead of winter, bitterly cold. And uh, I had some time before a meeting and I went out. And I'll talk a little bit later about how bad I am at sports photography. You know, I, I get to work with amazing sports photographers and I try to be like them and I just don't have it. But I saw this kind of action and I uh, thought instead of trying to capture the action, I would focus, kind of look in the opposite direction, really underexposed and go for all the texture in the ice. This is a pagoda in Myanmar and uh, I saw a whole line of women lined up ready to sweep the floor. And there were all these colorful bloom, brooms, and uh, I just couldn't resist. This is a small little series of images that may not appear as you think they are. On the left is uh, right by the hotel we stay at when we're at our offices in Japan. And I liked the uh, the red chevron shape, and, and I thought it was an interesting design play with the, the red in the window. And I was just waiting for something to happen. Uh, and nothing was happening. And my colleagues are over, you know, pointing at their watch and we're going to taxi and you know, something's going to happen. And then I captured this woman walking by. I didn't realize later that, you know, the way her feet are positioned, it looks like somebody else's legs. And the image on the right reminded me of some work that Stephen Wilkes did. Amazing photography, probably known for his day to night stuff. But he also did a series of uh, light poles and street lights and turning these into kind of... Uh, animated objects so a lot of people see a religious symbol on the right but basically that's just a light in a parking lot uh we were early for a meeting with an advertising agency we were uh, thinking of working with and uh, i just saw the shaft of light kind of in this lobby and i, I photographed it. i didn't think much of it but i put it in here because Jeff Dunas, who's the director of the Palm Springs Photo Festival, just loves this image. He just thinks it's beam me up, Scotty. So I thought I'd put that in there. It's just, you know, an everyday life mundane image that can be made sort of interesting. Uh, I was in Kansas City for a shoot. Uh, uh, most people in this country know Kansas City for the football team, but it's known as the City of Fountains. 
it's all like anything I, I try to photograph these fountains but I, you know they were like fountains so i thought this reflection of the fountain of itself was more interesting uh this is a farm in myanmar i was i took a couple of days cashed in some frequent flyer miles and uh because i was on my way to a video shoot we were doing in uh, i think it was in china and uh and that's basically it was kind of like brown and gray but i found that by you know shooting through this uh machine very rickety old machine that was i think it was some kind of wheat shaper thing i could uh, get a much more interesting image that reminded me of the grim reaper and on the right is uh, everyone running for cover and um, when it started to rain in tokyo uh reflection the rearview mirror in a classic car in cuba This reminded me of the original War of the Worlds movie that I saw when I was a kid in the aliens invaded the earth. Uh, these are, this is the parking lot at LAX and at the airport. And I just like the way that guy's foot looks like it's holding up the sculpture. And I'm always uh, attracted to parades and marching bands. And then I always get these boring shots, but I found by zooming in closer into this tuba, it, uh, gave something more interesting to look at so not everything is between meetings um my wife is british so we often spend uh, a few weeks every summer in the uk and i had been there uh, playing golf for a week earlier and then i was going to pick her up at, the, at heathrow if you know that part of the world and i was looking for something to do that was you know an hour drive away so i went to stonehenge on the left and i got all these amazing images of stonehenge that everyone else gets uh, so I did what Jay Maisel always said, you know, look behind you. That might be the more interesting image. And those are all the people photographing Stonehenge versus Stonehenge itself. And on the right is a uh, light coming in through Venetian blinds. And that's a refrigerator with magnets on it. Uh, <clears throat> for many years, many of us would go to a trade show called Photo Plus or Photo East. And it's in the Jacob Javits Center. And there are always for... I mean, I've been to, I went to that show, I was thinking about this almost 30 years, and you always see thousands of cameras on the inside, but no one was shooting outside, and this is just a reflection outside that building, and also, you know, a reflection of a walk, woman walking by after a rainstorm. And this was inspired by Jay Maisel. He talks about an image he shot, it says Green Park in London, and how he saw this uh, bandstand, and there was no shot, except when the light came out. I mean, when the sun peeked out from behind a cloud, the light came out and created these silhouettes, and that was the image. So I was there, it was a sunny day, and I had all these silhouettes, but I was just, there was nothing interesting about it until I was able to capture this person, which is kind of a double take. Obviously, she's on the phone, but because of where her hands are and the position of the silhouette, it makes it an interesting photograph. And this is a series of, if you have the camera and you're ready, uh, I was in India uh, with Greg Gorman, and we were doing the Epson Print Academy there. This is in the early days of uh, digital capture, et cetera. And it says right in front of my hotel, waiting for a driver to take us to the, where we're going to do this presentation. And at that time in India, buses would go by, and there was a person at the back. And when everyone got on the bus, that person would just smack the side of the bus to let the driver know it was safe to move forward. And the bus pulled up. This guy was just right there. He looked at me and, and I said, thank you. We were in New Orleans for a trade show way back when. And this woman wearing the same colors as uh, we see in the background, sitting in the perfect spot uh, against that white frame for separation. Thinking of Warren King and Rule of Thirds and where she's positioned. And it was another one where it was like, I was ready, captured it. South Beach, I saw these bright colors, complementary colors, some we call them vibrating colors, the yellows and blues, horizontal yellow, vertical blue, and like uh, great travel photographer Bob Chris, Bob Chris would always say, you know, a lot of people see the scene, move on. So I just waited and I waited for the right kind of person to walk by and just got very lucky with a woman with horizontal blue stripes walk by. And uh, this person was just sitting in the right spot between those blue stripes. 
we were uh, doing press briefings. They, they sound very exciting, but it's basically, you know, a couple of months before a product is introduced, we meet with the press to talk about it. And this was in San Francisco and we're walking back to the hotel and it was in the winter. So uh, light was low in the sky and uh, it was a green light and my colleagues are walking across the street and they're, and I, this guy's just stopped right in front of me. And my colleagues are saying, Hey, it's green light. I say, you nuts. This is the best shot. Go ahead. I love walking around uh, when I have some free time. Um, and it sounds like I travel the world. I, I'm showing several of these. Many of the shots are in, uh, places just in my own backyard, but this is Tokyo and it was a fire drill and a fire station. And I thought this was, uh, I kind of related to the guy in the far left because that more representative of my waistline. And I kind of hung around for a while because, you know, I obviously didn't speak the language, but some things are universal, like this guy who was listening for the fire alarm. Uh, I took a couple of days in, um, Myanmar before going to that video shoot and I went to this famous temple I think it's called the Shwedig I can't recall but the, the biggest pagoda famous place and you know I got the you know the standard pictures of the thing and the postcards and you know then I started looking for something else and there was this, this group and then I remembered this image that Eddie Adams had done Eddie spoke with us when we were in college and it was uh, I believe a, a Chinese military and they're all in alignment except one guy staring at him. So I, I used, I coughed really loud because I certainly couldn't speak the language. And I was able to get that one, that one person to look at me. And that's what helped break up that pattern. I used the same coughing technique to get this infant or toddler to look at me. And I was recently in Cuba at a, a photo workshop with Vincent Versace, and this is the Vinales, which is the area where they grow Cuban cigar, or they don't grow, they grow tobacco for Cuban cigars. And I saw this family and I coughed as loud as I could because I wanted that girl in the red outfit to look at me. She kept looking forward, but the cough startled the chicken. So it was a good compromise to uh, make this photograph. Doing a video in uh, north of Philadelphia, a place called Jefferson University, it's a textile printing. And the person we are interviewing had seen some of my work, said, oh, I love your work. And uh, yeah, I know great places to go shoot in uh, Philly. And usually when people tell me that, I'm gonna go, oh, you're gonna go to the Liberty Bell or you're gonna go see you know, Ben Franklin's this or that. And I said, yeah, what's that? And he said, you have to go to Graffiti Pier. Well, what's that? Oh, it's really hard to get to. It's unmarked. You kind of have to crawl around. You know, I said, I'm in. And it's basically a, an abandoned pier at that time that uh, artists were painting and with graffiti. And I, I was amazed by this place, uh, but it needed something. You know, it's easy to just photograph these things, but how do you make them more interesting? And I, this is one of the few times where I kind of posed something. I saw this guy wearing this tie-dye thing and Oh, what are you doing here? Oh, I like this. I said, okay, you're with me. Stand right here. I'll send you a photograph. And I made this image. This is also at the pier. I heard kids playing around. So I waited, used this vanishing point perspective, and then waited for something to happen. Uh, this is in East Germany. Uh, I was in Berlin for a trade show. Uh, I, In part of my responsibilities, I uh, present... Uh, color theory and talk a little bit about that a funny image coming up uh, and it was in Berlin and I'd never been there before so I went to East Berlin because I, I just wanted to experience the Cold War I wanted to experience all these great movies that I loved and everything about it and what I found was this modern place that was more modern West Berlin but there's this area uh, I can't recall what it's called but, uh, that is the original Berlin Wall that is still kept for artists to work on but again it was like eh, here's graffiti but when I found the right, you know, I was waiting for something to happen. And then this uh, teenager just ran up to the wall and did a handstand. This is a, a, an artist area uh, on the other side of Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, same thing, waited and waited, waited for something to happen. And then this person came out with the right color outfit. This is the neon boneyard in Las Vegas. I was calculating how many times I've been to Las Vegas on business because it's mainly trade shows and a few other things. It's almost about 50 times. And I, uh, it's different now. I think it's uh, uh, 
more open to the public. But at the time I did this, you needed special permission and there was a, you had to pay a fee and you would only have a one hour window to photograph this thing. So I, uh, uh, I think we were there for Photoshop world and I, I uh, Jay Mays always going to be there. He'd say, Hey Jay on me, you want, you want to go to the neon boneyard with me? Yeah, sure. You know, so it was like late August, early September, and I, I scheduled it our one hour for the best time of the day. So it's about 4.30, 5 p.m. So it's really hot and all that metal is reflecting all this heat. And we had one hour and, and uh, I said, go. And Jay said, yeah, do your thing. I'll do mine. And I was just running around uh, photographing everything I could. And I, I never saw Jay. And, and I'm looking for Jay at the end of the hour and I don't see him anywhere. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, I, I think I might have killed Jay with heat stroke. And then I just see him. He's just sitting on a chair in the shade. And uh, and I told him I shot all this stuff. I did this. I did this. I did this. And then he said, yeah, you know, I just sat here in the shade and I focused on the letter O that was in these signs. And of course, he got the better shots. Uh, this is from this workshop in Cuba, where most of the time I was able to do things on my own. But there were a few group settings that were set up with dancers and a few other things. And when that happens, I I often try to find different angles, something that people are not looking for. And I thought this was the better shot of the dancers. And uh, the four or five people in the workshop, they're on the other side of those pillars photographing this dancer. But I thought this was the better angle. I was asked to teach people in a reality TV show. It had to do with the America's Great Artist uh, on how to print. And it was set up at MICA, which is the Maryland Institute of Contemporary Art in Baltimore. And uh, we did that for a while. And then, you know, they said, they asked it, you know, if I could stick around and, you know, watch the, the taping, which I thought would be interesting because I do video production. I might learn things, but it's basically shoot anything that moves and it's all about editing later. So. After about 15 minutes, I just said, yeah, okay, I, I'm going to go out looking for pictures. And I, I often head to tourist areas and look for the non-tourist images. And this is in the inner, inner harbor of Baltimore. And, uh, and I always think in terms of something that, uh, you know, I learned along the way, and it was something that Warren King brought up around the Fibonacci number system. If you're not familiar with that, it's, it starts with one and three, and then the you add the numbers previous, so it's one, three, five, eight, thirteen, and those numbers tend to depict the golden mean, uh, spiral galaxies, uh, architectural features, things that are visually very appealing. So I'm always looking for threes and fives. And I saw these kids playing, and uh, and I started to see the five things happening. Went for the silhouette, and uh, I was able to make this image. Uh, you'll see here in a little bit that. Because they're moving slow, I can get the image. I don't do well with, with sports and things that are moving too fast. It's about impact, something I learned in high school. Some people would say, oh, your highlights are blowing out. Oh, you know, it's like, who cares? It's like this visual impact that just stops you want to take a look. Impact and mood. Uh, this is uh, what it's like to travel through Detroit at many other airports. And this is how I feel sometimes on Monday mornings, the Monday morning blues going through the airport. Uh, I spent a lot of time at Chicago O'Hare, and I was doing a car shoot with a former uh, high school uh, person uh, in Detroit, uh, Gil Smith, and, uh, and his partner, Andre LaRoche. And I watched them sh when they were shooting this Ferrari for a print sample. And, it, and you do like 12, 15 different angles. They would compose them together later, but they would always do a shot where they put the camera directly on the ground and then uh, oil up the floor or put some kind of water surface down to get the reflections. So I always remember that. And at O'Hare, it's filled with these lines. And, you know, this is uh, the camera directly on the floor on the left in order to get, the, it's just a straight photograph. There's nothing else going on. Dawn at the airport. Uh, we were at, uh, I can't remember, I think Jeff mentioned uh, Atlanta before, many times we're, we're in Atlanta a lot, and this is a well-known place about a two-hour drive north of Atlanta, it's the world's largest junkyard. I've been there before, but it's the kind of place where the light has to be right, and, uh, and one of the days I was there and I could get away because it was foggy and I headed up to Old Car City, and I always remember, you know, what uh, 
Bob, Chris talked about these things. You got to work the scene. You want to do tight shots, wide shots, medium shots, do everything you can, you know, while you, know, you have the light there. And uh, sometimes they're, it's just all there for you. And, you know, shot all, I don't know, probably about 30 amazing images in two hours. And sometimes I'll go months without getting a single image. It's just the nature of that kind of stuff. And I love this image because it reminded me of the early days of HDR photography, but because it was overcast, it was just a straight photograph. The stuff I see from Manhattan to uh, Slab City, and uh, I started seeing uh, at county fairs uh, kids being put in these giant bubbles that can run around in. And I just like the abstract nature of these things. Love shooting people, and of course, what I learned from Greg Gorman, it's all about the eyes, you know, and that the eyes are the windows to the soul. And that it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, it's about, you know, capturing what's in those eyes. I didn't see the fly until later, but I, I think I like it. In Myanmar, there's this, uh, I think it's considered a cosmetic called, uh, mis maybe mispronouncing, Thanica or whatever. It's a bark substance that uh, many women rub all over their faces and arms. And I was intrigued by that, but I realized it wasn't about that. It was about the eyes. And from the young and those kind of skin tone features uh, to different kinds of skin tones of people in a farming community. And if you can't get the eyes, I'm still looking for the emotion. And, and you know, where appropriate, I'd love to convert to black and white. This gets to gesture. And this is a person fishing with a line. And that's an animate object, a person fishing. But cable car tracks in San Francisco at the right light, while inanimate, they also have their own form of gesture. Warren King, rule of thirds, rule of thirds. I, I like to go to important sites that are memorials. This is the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. Um, and, and it's a very large area if you've been there. It's a very moving place. Uh, but I was looking for something. And when I, when I saw shadows being cast on these stones, and I could get that shadow in the right spot, I think that's what made the image for me. Same thing, I also went to Dachau, a, a very emotional, moving place. But I waited for, for something, and, and it was that bird that made this image. The Vietnam Memorial in D.C., and the reflection of the person reading the names. And this is uh, Manzanar, which is the Japanese, the former site of the Japanese internment camp, in this kind of beautiful place in, uh, in history that's a uh, tough history, but important to understand it and to remember. So uh, I, I mentioned, I, I work with amazing sports photographers. I try real hard. I'm not really good at it. My, my sports shots or my action shots are when the action's over. It reminds me, I remember going to the Eddie Adams workshop and Bill Epridge, who was a photojournalist who needed to find something else after he, he experienced his own kind of personal trauma photographing you know, the RFK assassination. He, he's, he, he did sports without balls. That was his thing. I always found that kind of amusing term, but you know, I do action in sports where there's not a lot of action. So this is a boxer after training. Uh, this is a, a shot. We were in San Francisco for those press reviews. The light was good. All my colleagues were at, uh, dinner and, and Jeff, you'll know that Mark Redonia saying, dude, you know, what are you doing? I said, look, just read me the menu, you know, at the restaurant because the light's good. And uh, I knew this was a good scene. I was waiting for something to happen. And the the, the nice part is that um, these are not athletes, so they weren't running real fast. And because it's San Francisco, they were running up a hill to a bus. So they're going just slow enough that I could capture them. Colors in a boxing training facility. 
and this is in Kyoto. Uh, Kyoto is known for these amazing shrines, amazing gardens, uh, and I photographed all those things, and, and I love those things, and um, they're very pleasing to me, but they're, they kind of look like everyone else's. The best shot I did in Kyoto were these kids who were late running from their bus, they're heading to the subway, and I use this in my opening presentations when I'm uh, teaching projection color theory, and people are not familiar with it because uh, each kid has uh, an RGB umbrella. It's red, green, blue umbrellas. Red, green, blue umbrellas. Uh, this is at a skate park, not far from our office. And I'm trying really hard. People are flying in the air and I'm trying to get this stuff and I, I just don't have it. I don't have a decisive moment. Maybe I, you know, it, it's not the gear, it's me. But when I saw this kid wipe out and you can tell I kind of hurt him a little bit and he was getting up slow and moving slow because I, uh, I knew the scene reminded me of this next image. And uh, I waited for him to slowly walk into position and then I got my shot. But it reminded me of an image I shot earlier at the Great Sand Dunes in uh, Colorado. And because uh, I was in uh, at the Santa Fe uh, photo workshops, and it was actually kind of in, right at the tail end of the pandemic and airline flights were crazy. And I had to drive from Santa Fe to Denver. It was like eight or an hour drive. So I stopped at this place. And again, I, I'm not showing a lot of nature stuff. I love doing it, but my stuff tends to look like everyone else's. But uh, I just saw the connection between that and that. And probably the best sports image that I shot, Kevin, this is in your uh, backyard. I was at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, I was there working with something in the press center. And I was given the the vest. If, you're, if you've been around photojournalism, uh, photojournalists, uh, with credentials they're given different colored vests depending on the venue and this colored vest let me go anywhere so i went through the famous gasoline alley and got every picture that everyone else got and i went in the pits and i got all the image that everyone else got and i, did, I photographed the drivers this is the time trials and then remembering jay mazel you know sometimes the best images behind you this is my best sports picture of the person watching the sporting event i love this image Walking around New York. I love silhouettes. Obviously, you're seeing a lot of those. I love the scene with the silhouette of the person not spilling his coffee. Help interrupt those patterns. I love this this scene. It reminded me of when I was a, a kid in school. They used to have the, uh, the an evolutionary chart from, from um, fish to people and monkeys and gorillas and apes. And it reminded me of that. The funicular tracks in Lisbon, uh, but again, waiting for the right person to interrupt those patterns. This was uh, walking into the Print Academy in Vancouver, and I, and I saw this scene. And I love negative space. It, the first magazine I ever saw as a teenager was Peterson's Photographic, if you remember that. And there was a, a story about negative space, and I, I didn't understand it. But then I saw some of the images, and I was just mesmerized by it. And so I, I love shooting these kinds of images where there's a lot of space. This is just, uh, it was on a lunch break, uh, not far from our office. This is in Atlantic City. A lot of people, this was a trade show. I think it was Imaging USA, or then called PPA. And people were saying, oh, Atlanta City's a dump. So whenever I hear, oh, it's a dump, I'm looking forward to it because it's usually great pictures for me. Havana. I'm not sure what this person is doing, but I just love the scene and the reflections. I was in uh, Portland, Maine, heading up to the Maine Photographic Workshops for a um, presentation I had to give and uh I thought of Jay Maisel again sorry if I'm repeating about too many Jay things but he likes to say you know I'm from New York I don't trust any air I can't see it when there's this kind of fog you want to take advantage of it and but it's not just photographing the fog so what I saw were wow it's the fog wow I've got three in the Fibonacci number system and then I got the gesture of that person's hand waiting in line for coffee at Starbucks in the morning I was in Hong Kong for a day before we crossed the border there to go to a factory to do some video stuff. And it was really lousy weather. So I went into the 
top of the um, those English double decker buses that are in Hong Kong and just played around with blurs. So outside my hotel in Toronto, uh, jet lagged and and this just kind of represented the insomnia I was feeling at the time. I was in New York last year for the build show and I was on my way to the airport and got a message that flights are canceled because of storms. And I go, great, because, you know, there's worse places to be stuck in Manhattan. So I uh, headed back into the city and uh, it was sticky, thunderstorms, hot. And I just, but the light was really low and almost like that green sky. I just went into Times Square and just started playing around with camera movements. And what I love about this is if you, if you look, there's like different stories in all these different, I can see four different stories that are happening within all those blurs. This, uh, I want to be careful not to do much, uh, too much of an Epson thing, but when I made a very large print of this, it's a whole different experience than smaller on a screen. Utilizing slow motion and blurs because the light was really bad at this um, monastery that I went to. But again, thinking about Warren King and that central that point of impact and in that third position. Classic panning shot. Now in Cuba, everyone likes to photograph cars and you know I had to do that, but I kind of did this little series of guys in their cars because they're primarily men. This was on the, uh, the funicular tram in Lus Lisbon, and you can see a little bit in the bottom right the angle they're at. And those aren't shutters, but they're actually bricks that have been painted. So I was um, near the office on a Sunday, and I was just driving by uh, for you know, getting ready for the next day, and I, I saw this, this colored sidewalk, and I thought it was pretty amazing. And I was out there photographing, and this guy dressed like this came out, and he starts yelling at me. He thought I was a city inspector. I have every right to paint this sidewalk. I have a permit. And I said, dude, I, and he was asking me, what are you doing? I said, I just love the colors. And he got a big smile on his face. You like it? Yeah, I did it. And it was He was a barber in front of uh, Jerry's Barber Shop. And, I, and he posed for me, and he's kind of, uh, he had spats on at the time. And then, then he invited me into this barber shop. And, and, you know, based on my hairline, I hadn't been in a barber shop in uh, some time. So it's Sunday afternoon, the barber shop. He says, "Yeah, you want a beer?" And I goes, yeah, sure, why not? And I just had this amazing experience. And this barber shop was filled with all this memorabilia and crazy stuff he was collecting. He was known as kind of Crazy Jerry of Long Beach. But it just kind of shows that you know, in photography, there's so many interesting people and things and friendships that you can make, and that it's uh, much more than just capturing an image and, and taking it off. Uh, and that's a uh, image on the right is a flower market. And these are images that I captured in those flower markets. This is not a between meeting thing. This is on vacation. This is the little village where my wife is from. And I was mesmerized as an American, of course, with the uh, the phone box, the, the classic phone box. And I was looking at all the scratches and because uh, and I think it was still operational. Uh, but then I started to realize the real image was if I just kind of backed up to have that memorial in the background and the light hit it just right. This is through a um, taxi window uh, while it's raining. So we were at Adobe Max. And for those of you that uh, do a lot of trade shows or work at trade shows, it's usually crazy hours, set up, have to wait. So I can't remember the details, but... Uh, We'd done set up, but we had to come back the next day. And so we had some free time. And I always, when I'm in a town, kind of, I'll just Google now, you know, what's happening in town. And it was the day of the Dead Festival. So great. It was at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, you know, where famous people are buried. You're great. So I went over there and I, you know, those images on the left are, you know, I shot all those images and they're like you know, the images everyone else shots, but shoots. But uh, the image on the right is, uh, to me, that's a Dano picture, and the title of this one is Even the Dead Have to Go. These are images that are kind of inspired, again, by Jay Maisel, who likes to talk about no color color on the right, but still that gesture and that mood, and it's not always about super saturated color. 
This is the world's largest bicycle parking lot. It's three stories, huge. And uh, it was in the winter, so because of the ecliptic, the sun was really low, and I wanted to get these reflectors uh, bouncing up. And, and fortunately, this one woman came into the scene and stopped. So I was like, great, because you know I'm not really good with action. And, and so she's there. But then I had to move my head around because I was in the shop casting the shadow. So I positioned myself and you see me go right in there. That's me. And I kind of was able to hide myself in there so I can get these two reflectors to pop. This is my uh, image I like to talk about, my hypocrisy in that I love tough areas. I love these kinds of scenes, uh, but this is the Salton Sea. And I also love to play golf at really nice courses. So in Palm Springs, I'll go play golf at kind of a you know semi-fancy place. And people often call me a hypocrite for you know doing that and you know, like photographing these things. But I always vow that I, I never play golf in good light. If the light's good, if we go out with the camera. Things you see on the street. Out in the salt and sea. So school in Cuba. Uh, when you go to Cuba in groups, uh, there's you have to do certain educational things. And we were, it was quite interesting. We were in the home of uh, Afro-Cuban drummers. Uh, and it was okay. And then after a while, the drumming was sort of getting to me. And there's really no image of this. These people were just listening to music. But then look, looked around and this was the picture. The County Fair in LA. Gesture. Whenever I'm in cities that have subways, I always go down there and just ride around and get out. And sometimes the best pictures are in there and some of the best gestures are in there. Uh, I have no idea why these kind of children's Plastic tables are used in certain Asian countries, but I, I just love the way they look. Kind of a analog mechanic, not a lot of digital stuff going on there. So uh, I mentioned Las Vegas earlier. I, I think I've made about 50 trips to Las Vegas and people say, oh, it's so glamorous. Oh, isn't it great? If you've been there long enough, it's like, yeah. I like to head down downtown to Fremont Street. To me, that's the real Las Vegas on the left. And on the right is uh, you know, walking to a trade show. And I just thought the silhouette said it all. This is in London. And uh, these are um, heads for hats or hats for heads. Different kind of head shot. Different kind of head gear. Uh, this is literally down the street from my mother-in-law's house in that same village. It was a kite festival. And, and I put this and there's a couple others up because they're older images shot on lower megapixel cameras. And uh, I've been able to bring them back to life because of some of these amazing tools there are, gigapixel AI and photo AI and various denoising things uh, that I can bring back the image that was really there and not look at all the technical issues. And if you it's count them all, good. there's a Fibonacci number of kites. Yeah, Kevin was just asking, what kind of camera do you travel with now? Or do you use a variety of lenses or a zoom? Or... I am basically a one lens person. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently have been using the uh, a Nikkor 24-200. I just got the 28-400. Uh, but I've worked with um, Sony cameras and lenses, but I, there's kind of an old adage, the more lenses you have, the fewer pictures you take. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, I go out with one camera and one zoom. Cool. Thanks. I brought this back um, kind of from life or from that early trip I did with the Print Academy in India with Greg Gorman. Very noisy. It was just horrible, terrible shadow detail, but these tools can help bring it back. Same thing here. This is in, uh, I just love everything yellow. It's in Tijuana and it's a Tijuana taxi. So ode to Herb Albert. And this final little stretch here is on pants. 
hands in Hong Kong. This is a Labor Day parade last year in Manhattan. Cowboy in Cuba. I can't remember where I shot this. It's funny, I can look at images for the most part, except this and one other. Uh, I knew exactly where it was and what and I, all the emotions I was feeling at the time, yet I often can't find a, a park my, my car in a parking lot. Uh, this was in Montreal. It was um, later in the year and everything had been put away for the winter and there was a warm day. So all the waiters were putting out the umbrellas again for um, outdoor dining. It was almost an optical illusion of hands. And uh, I think the hand just tells the story here. This was a commuter on a boat in Myanmar. And uh, while we're drawn to the eyes, I think it's almost the out of focus hands that uh, kind of tell the story. And this was a couple of weeks ago. This is the United Club at O'Hare. Uh, it's relatively new if you know that airport and uh, it's on the Seagate side. And I remember walking in, it's new and it's nice. And I, I heard people talking about, wow, just look at the amazing salad bar. And I was going, yeah, wow. Look at the amazing light hitting that window. And that's what I got here. Uh, I'm on to the next meeting uh, tomorrow morning, going down to New York. And how are we doing yeah. on time? And <clears throat> Yeah, your Welcome. timing is timing is really good. Those were, overall, I've seen a lot of your pictures before from some of the things we've done together. But I'm, you know, always been inspired by the fact that you go out and you know you just take the walks and find the shots and you know go to the obscure places and you know find pure gold. So, uh, and it's also cool to see you know such an influence from Jay in in your work. Any of us that know Jay can certainly see that. Um, oh, a lot of that. Yeah. So really, really amazing stuff. And um, I thank you. Anybody have yeah. questions? Well, Jeff had a question about keeping, do you keep a running list of projects you shoot for, like the hands, or do you keep collections in Lightroom or something like that for? Um, uh, no, you know, I, I have to emphasize it's uh, this, I have a day job and uh, this is <laughs> a hobby. And, and uh, I'm embarrassed to say, I probably have, about nine years of files I haven't even had a chance to look at. Uh, but uh, may, I probably should be more diligent and be a better uh, organizer of files and themes, but I just kind of um, go out and shoot <laughs> when I can. We'll just call you the, the male of Vivian Meyer. Well, um, a bold Vivian Mayer. Well, she's, um, <laughs> I was actually asked by someone in an interview, some of my favorite photographers, and I mentioned Vivian Meyer, and, along with um, Arnold Newman, mm. Dorothea Lane, yep. and that kind of style. Mm. And so there's a definite connection there. I just found something that ties a bunch of us together here. I'm just going to share my screen for a second. You said, didn't it pop up? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, last time I went down to the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, I spent two days doing nothing but looking at Arnold Newman images. Mm -hmm. Whose yeah, names I was are very, the very there. fortunate to um, okay, to you're work up with now. Arnold. Yeah. Oh, and 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 his notebooks and appointment books. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. I, this was in Seattle. Yeah, I remember. yeah, this is like 2008 or 2009. Jeff looks the same. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Greg in the background. Cool. Dano, I have to tell you, um, <laughs> you should have stayed in the photography. You might have been able to make it big. Uh, you know, when uh, when I saw that image of yours and I knew that I didn't have it, it's the greatest thing that happened in my career. 
Well, uh, that's one good thing, Jeff. You've you've done somebody some something good for a chance. You know, I kind of went a different path. I went to business school, but I, you know, now I'm very fortunate. I can, you know, have that balance of art, design, business. And... Well, the other thing is, you get to hang around with some of the world's best photographers. That's got to rub off on you. It, well, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, I'm just very, very fortunate in that regard. And, uh, and many of these are my heroes from when, you know, when I was in school and, and also, I, you know, we're closely finding all the new talent and, you know, in a, in a changing world. But if you have that kind of foundation of composition and design, there's, you know, there's a lot of people that get into photography, especially if you're of a certain age, you got into it because of the technology and, you know, love mastering that. I got into photography in some ways because I couldn't draw. You know, I knew there was something in me, but I couldn't, I couldn't draw, but I could <laughs> yeah, use photography I, that way. I had that the, happen too. Yeah, but the core of <clears throat> the core of it is there. The technology enables you to, you know, express yourself photographically. And, you know, as we move forward with AI and all these other things, you know, I see a lot of bad stuff because, you know, technically it's amazing what you can do but it's missing that sense of all the things that i learned from warren king from jay mazel and all these other amazing photographers you Have know you i have to say i have to say that i always knew you as the evangelist for epson but uh your photography is marvelous and the color the form the gesture to go back to jay mazel uh, we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before and and your your photos are just great well, I I um, was inspired as I you know as Jeff alluded to I was at the Eastman Kodak Company for a period of time, and uh, this is kind of a funny thing. Uh, I was always in trouble at Kodak because I was always you know <laughs> touching things. People have all sorts of stories, and when uh, I was recruited by Epson, and I, I remember in the interview with the person I was going to work for, who's now the CEO of Epson. And he said, you know, you're the right, you seem like the right guy and what we want to do. Cause Epson then was really not known in photography. I said, but you know, kind of what scares us is that, you know, you're from Kodak, you know, Kodak. And I saw, oh, no, you know, I'm in because I was always in trouble. <laughs> uh, but I've tried to maintain that, that commitment that, or even as Jay would even say visual pushups to put out there. Cause I think it helps me and my interactions with other photographers. Uh, but I, uh, you know, this is one of the very few times I've actually presented my own work because I don't, it's not about me in the day job, but I do that so that I'm I have better, more credibility and it makes me a better marketing person working with photographers and also knowing what professionals and also serious amateur photographers have to go through in order to either get the shot or stay in business. And also learning to identify what is a good photograph. A lot of people, you know, they, they look at the work that they've shot and they have a hard time seeing the good stuff. But uh, David, you had your, you were waving your hand. Un, unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Yeah, you're, you're still muted, David. Okay, it's just such a pleasure to see such a collection of photos that were taken with no no purpose in mind to to to, to uh, you know for an exhibit or for a, a, a to, for a career, and they're just they're just fantastic. But my 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 question is, and I think it faces all of us. Number one, how do you store all of these photos and manage them, and what do you think is going to happen to them? Because there's so many beautiful photos there. I mean, our, what, what will happen to our photos? Well, there's people that are uh, more skilled at it than I am. But what I have a raid. And whenever I come back from a trip, uh, one of the first things I try to do is, uh, you know, download them. And I, I organize things by the month, year, and location. Uh, and then I can... I can look back on stuff from eight years ago, as I mentioned earlier. Oh yeah, I was, I had to go to this trade show, but I remember there was this event and I was able to go and do, I can remember that stuff. I don't know if that's, I'm, I'm not doing any sophisticated um, metadata stuff that other people do. Uh, you, know, you mean like uh, 
our good friend Seth Resnick. He likes to have 70 keywords for a, uh, yeah. a photograph. Yeah. Well, uh, well, if you can do that, that's great. Uh, and, and if you're a photojournalist, you know, they're the real pros at uh, keywording and, and uh, Jeff, I forgot. It's an I, I it's four letters. I T C something. Uh, I P T C I think. Yeah. yeah. And utilizing that in, in programs like photo mechanic. Um, well, I guess part of the question is, do you have kids or is there someone that's going to have you? What's your legacy when you're gone? You're like so many people have all their photos on their phone. Are they just going to hand their phone to their kids? That's a that's a bigger uh, discussion. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to bias it with my Epson. It's not an Epson show around, you know, can always see the prints. But, you know, can how many of you have uh, files on floppy disks, uh, you know, and jazz drives and things like that? Yep, it's, it's the print that counts. You don't have a photograph till you have the print. There, there are 95 million photos uploaded to Instagram every single day. Every day. I, I think that's... I think and that's one or two of them are actually good. Maybe. And, and the, you know, half of them are you know, AI now. I spend all my time deleting all this stuff off of Facebook. That people I think it's, a, it's billion, not million. Yeah, billion. it's a billion. Yeah, when I had COVID uh, fever... The only way I was going to get cured is if I looked at every single one of them. <laughs> it was like it was like the fever dream, you know. Uh, yeah, I, it's a big. So to answer your, David, your original <clears throat> question, it's a much bigger discussion. And um, will AI help us find stuff? You know, you type Wait. in. I remember I was in Chicago in 1986, and there is there an image of, and boom, there it is. Oh, um, we do have plans to eventually uh, have a chat like that. I know Jeff and I have talked about um, our collections and our bodies of work uh, quite a bit and what to do with it. Um, and I think that we'll try to do an open discussion somewhere along the line on just that one topic, because I think um, you know, looking at the age of this audience, um, it's something that is something that we need to think about. I, I've certainly started addressing it. I, I know a few of you others that probably have. And um it's important because you know a lot of us have a lot of good work that maybe there's one or two good photographs in there I, it's my kid's inheritance i'm not giving him any money i said here take one of these things out to the street corner maybe you can make a buck but i do have prints and i think that's important and signed that's important too that's why i joined apag if you're familiar with apag no what's apag american photography archive group Okay, that's interesting. And, and it's basically for, oh, it was started because somebody inherited their parents' photo archive and didn't know what to do with it and started talking to other people and either they inherited an archive or they had one of their own that they didn't know what to do with and it kind of grew. And it's the the um, URL is just apag.us and, and they have I meetings know. every second or third Friday and some famous archives in that it's not unknown people mm -hmm. yeah let's take a look at that that's uh, i'm the first time also I've heard some about that. archives of some very well-known people too yeah cool well it's, a, it's a it's a question <laughs> it's a question we all face uh, as we move forward you know photography's brought a lot of satisfaction and it's you know my my been my life and i know looking at the the audience here it's been the life of many others uh, also so um we'll have to well, I think the last thing I'm last thing I do on my deathbed is I'm going to make sure that my uh, my web my my website registration is like paid out for another twenty years. <laughs> wow. so, that, so that the pictures will be somewhere. I thought you were going to uh, say you're just going to burn everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got well, I got I a thought burn about that too, but. Uh, Hard drives speaking, make a horrible smell when when they burn. You know? Speaking of a website, Dano, do you have a site with all your work on it? Uh, I only use uh, Instagram now of uh, Dano underscore Steinhardt. Okay. Good. Yeah, I have a burn barrel for all those ectochrome chromes mm -hmm. I have from work for all yeah. those years. Yeah. When when Dano was uh, my Kodak uh -huh. rep. That's right. Mm. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, you know, you were a TSR, weren't you? Yeah. Started as a, well, I started as uh, uh, as a commercial tower in Chicago till you know, Jeff had his way with me. Then I was a TSR in Manhattan in the photo district, which is where I started. What years were you in the photo district? I'm sorry? What years were you in the photo district? 
I was there 88 to 95. It's just after I've left that area. Yeah. Uh, TSRs but, were valuable assets for yeah. any working photographer at one time. It was it was the kind of the dream. You know, I, I was looking to make a uh, a change, and that was a, a great fit. And I remember, you know, one of the I was always uh, you know having issues. <laughs> Issues, but it's always the oddball Kodak. And they gave us, we went through this training that was supposed to be nine months to be a TSR, and, and I kind of powered through it quicker because of my background. And they gave us a map of the United States and they said, Well, where do you want to go? And you can't go to where you're at. That was a Kodak thing. If you came from Chicago, you couldn't go to Chicago. So I was enamored with Seattle, you know, in John's part of the world. And I said, uh, Seattle. And I said, Basically, anywhere but New York City. So Kodak sent me to New York City. <laughs> did you work with michael Gurley? sure i okay. actually um owe him a lot because uh, i took his job well he wanted out of a marketing role mm -hmm. in rochester and he called me up saying you want my job i gotta get out of here and i said yeah you know and that's how i moved into marketing because he wanted to move to seattle I, I cannot tell you how many fights I had with Eastman Kodak in the, the mid to late 70s. Oh, hmm. I could imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Kodak was but, an amazing company and did amazing things and, and certainly was a big part of my life in a positive way. But, you know, they sort of ran into this concept. Uh, I'm going to show you my, you know, my, B, my B school stuff. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma. It's a great book by Christensen at Harvard on how it, an incumbent company invents a disruptive technology and then becomes a victim of it. And, and there's ways out of the innovator's dilemma, but it's hard. It's, when you're a publicly traded company, and you invent a disruptive technology, you know, how to cannibalize yourself and convince Xerox that's in their best interest to lose money over a long period. Well, you know, they, they were doing a lot of cool stuff at, at uh, yeah. Kodak and those big buildings that uh, we, you and I have talked about many a time. Yeah. You know, they should be the, the, they should own this industry. You know, uh, Steve Sasson invented the digital cameras. He lives not mm -hmm. far. And, uh, you know. I, I don't you know, know if they, you know, know Louis Kondax, who, who invented dye transfer, and they hired, and they put him on their, their R&D evaluation board. And I had dinner at his house one night. He was telling me that he was in the board meeting one day when this guy came in to present his new invention that he wanted Kodak to back. The, guy, the guy's name was Chester Carlson. Yeah, I've heard that story. But... Yeah. And, and yeah. At, at the time, carbon paper was a big cash cow for Eastman Kodak. So they, they were not interested. Yeah, that became uh, Xerox. Uh... My favorite story like that personally, and I see Henry Wilhelm's on here, and I can't remember this guy's name, but it, at one point I was Epson's representative, um, the ISO committee to establish a print permit standard. And I was meeting with a lot of older guys, and there was this one guy with a heavy German accent. I don't know if Henry could tell you his name. Uh, but he, he was a guy that invented Cibachrome. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, you know, because I, I did Cibachrome in high school, and you remember. Like remember those tablets you had to put in it to, so it wouldn't destroy yeah. your plumbing and all that stuff. And I and the rumor was it was like the most toxic thing in the history or whatever. And, and I asked this guy, hey, did anyone die from Cibachrome? You know, and it was and, and he got very upset <laughs> with me. And oh, you look what you know, and he was like with German accent, and he was like really kind of belittling me. And who are you, you non-scientist? You asked me such a question. And then he, there was a pause, and then he said, Well, there was this person who drank it once. Oh, God. <laughs> that's colorful that, that that was an ilford product wasn't it yes yeah yeah, well, uh, yeah. actually cibachrome uh, uh based guide. on the gaspar color process created by uh bella gaspar a hungarian chemist is that the guy you're talking about but C no um cibachrome Ciba was owned by geige Right. Steve Steve, yeah. Steve was a Swiss pharmaceutical company in Basel. Yeah. Oh, good. They could get you sick and then cure you. Wonderful. Then, yeah. I just remember uh, this Ilford, guy's name was Il Ilford bought them. Ilford bought that process from Seba. 
1969, I was getting a tour of the Agfagar research labs <laughs> in Leverkusen, and they're taking me through a part of the lab where they're testing color products for permanence. And we walked past several prints, and I said, this looks like Cibachrome prints. This, that's not your product. They said, oh, we developed that technology like 10 years ago, and we decided it was just too dangerous and too expensive, and we keep the prints up on the wall, but we never did anything with it. And, and I'm sure it was invented by several different people at several different times, but um, Agfa never wanted to do it. Yeah, it was nasty stuff. You knew when they gave you a pair of rubber gloves that you were in for it. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember in high school, the, remember the drum and you had to roll yep. the drum around. And, yeah, yep, I, like, I remember. And then it was that. that, and the, it was. I guess it was some kind of calcium carbonate that would neutralize the acid, and the stuff would, uh, mm. you know, yeah. dissolve oh. before otherwise you would destroy the plumbing in your. Jeff's house. Jeff sharing again. <laughs> oh. So Dano, explain. You're going to keep doing this head shot series. Yeah. Um, well, that's the. Uh, the original shot and it was this uh ken geiger said that's not the crop you know you want to be higher so yeah i i think it's going to be called uh, getting ahead you know <laughs> <laughs> i love it well it's a recognizable head you gotta trademark it i'll send you the uh, other shots of you holding your head in the close-up yeah it could it could be part of the um i could make a triptych out of it <laughs> All right. Well, Dano, oh. um, any other questions and comments? Anybody from from JP or Mac or uh, did Mac go? Yeah, I don't see his name. Yeah, Mac. Mac was here, and uh, Vincent's here. Vinny is hiding. He's got his camera off. Yeah, and the digital dog is here too. Andrew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's there I am. <laughs> hey Vinny, you're sideways. I am. I'm lying on my couch. Ah, okay. <laughs> Again. D Dana, are you gonna be down here in Dallas for imaging in January? Um, um I'm I'm don't know where I'm gonna be in, in May, so you know. <laughs> so Dana, you said you're going to New York City tomorrow? Yeah, uh I'm there for uh, APAD and uh, some other meetings. Oh, I'm going to be there. Uh, Becky and I are coming. When? I'm actually going to shoot portraits of uh, Jack uh, Resnicki uh, and uh, Stephen Wilkes. Yeah, what day are you there? Uh, Thursday through, uh, we leave Monday. Tomorrow? Hmm? Yeah, tomorrow. we're, gonna, we're get, getting there tomorrow and then oh. leaving Monday. I'll, uh, I'll text you. I, I might have some, some time on Saturday before I have to go out to L.A. Yeah, that'd be oh, fun. Cool. And How long JP's going to be there tomorrow, but really? he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Oh, hey, we should like uh, pretend yeah, it's 20, what I'm doing 20 years ago and do a color man. <laughs> What'd you say, JP? I said, I know what I'm doing. I'm supporting my gallery dealer. You don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but yeah, I'll be there Thursday and, and Friday. And it, uh, I'll. If, I think I'm going there Saturday. I'll, we'll see. That'd be kind of cool. cool. I'll text you guys. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, we're going to stop the recording and uh, get on our way. I appreciate everybody that uh, was here today. Thanks, uh, thanks to all my old friends there and Vincent for taking me to Cuba because that made my presentation, I think. <laughs> Dano, thanks for all you do and uh, all the many things that are, are going on. Uh, you and Henry and I and a bunch of others got to get together sometime soon. I'm just looking at calendar dates and trying to get past a few oh, yeah. workshops. So we'll, we'll be having some fun hopefully soon. Great. Cool. And uh, everybody, thanks for coming as always. Um, we'll put the uh, notices for the next uh, couple of uh, uh, chats up online in the very near future here. So. You've got Holger and Rad Drew coming up, and uh, both of them are going to have some really good stuff to, to share. And um, I'm talking to... put Dano's uh, Instagram uh, uh, URL in the, uh, in the chat. It's not hard to find if you search for it either, so... Um, yeah, but I never can spell his last name. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's an yeah, I or E after C. E I N H A R D T. That's the one. That silent D gets you all the time. Yeah, yeah. Hard. I got one last question for before you guys go. Oh, it's Von yeah. Thomas. Hey. Hey, hey, Kevin. How are you? All right. Dan, uh, is there any upgrade to the Epson P20,000 uh, in the future? Uh-oh, it's work. It's the day job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was just announced. Yeah. The P20, 570. You know, Epson makes amazing printers with names that I just wish would. Anyway. Okay, what's the difference yeah. between that one and the one I have you see in the background? You have the 20,000? Yes. So um, it's a, it's the ink set that's in the P9570. So you're going to get an expanded uh, color gamut. It's ink bags instead of cassettes. So it's a separate uh, unit of ink bags in a, in a rack. So each bag is 1.5 liters instead of 700 milliliters. So mm -hmm. it's much more for you know production in, in those kind of environments. Well, this uh, is my shop you see in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looks, when is that going to be available? I It was just announced yeah, at a trade show a couple of weeks ago. I don't have an exact shipping date yet. Okay. It might be. Frankly, I, I, uh, I'll have to check the uh, press release because I wasn't prepared for that on this call. <laughs> but I would assume it's going to be in you know a few months. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Where are you, where are you based? Santa Monica. Oh. First edition oh, yeah? printing on Ocean Park in Santa Monica. Where? From uh, Santa Monica Airport. I may, Monica, uh, yeah. I, I may give you a call. All right. You stop on by. <laughs> it's it's Thomas Editions? Thomas Editions, yes. On Thomas. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks again for being here. Dano, thanks a lot. We'll be talking Thank sometime you. soon. See you Safe travels for everybody. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Great. Thank you. Take care. Hasta la vista, baby. Baby. Bye-bye.